Let us pray. O Lord God, our merciful Father, we come before you in awe and wonder as we consider the amazing love that you have shown to rebellious humankind in the suffering and death that your Son so patiently endured. Lord, fill us with an ever greater appreciation for the sacrifice you made for us. All the worship and praise that we can give cannot thank you enough for what you have done for us. Accept our praise today and increase our faith and love for you. Hear us for Christ's sake. Amen. Please rise. We will follow the order of morning service as you find it on page 5 in the forepart of the Lutheran hymnal and is outlined in your bulletin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Oh, 
Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto Thee that we are, by nature, sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against Thee by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to Thine infinite mercy, seeking and imploring Thy grace for the sake of our Lord, Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who hast given Thine only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for His sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by Thy Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of Thee and of Thy will, and true obedience to Thy word, to the end that by Thy grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given His only Son to die for us and for His sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on His name, He gives power to become the sons of God and has promised them His Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am desolate and afflicted. Unto you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me never be put to shame. be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, look with favor on the desires of your humble servants and stretch out the right hand of your power to defend us against all our enemies. We come to you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
The Old Testament lesson chosen for this, the third Sunday in Lent, is taken from the book of Exodus, from chapter 3. We'll read the familiar account of the burning bush, verses 1 through 15. The burning bush was indeed an odd sight, flames of fire that did not consume. God's message was also an odd one. The ground was too holy for your sandals, but not for your sinful feet. God still has mercies on, mercy on sinners today through His Son, the great I Am Himself, the living God, who delivers His people through His own blood. Exodus chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you. And this sign shall, this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, sure, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Those are the words of our Old Testament lesson for this morning. The epistle lesson for this morning is taken from the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthian Christians from chapter 10. We'll read the first 13 verses. The Lord had delivered his people in spectacular fashion, and Israel had every reason to trust God's promises. And yet, many of them served their own bodies and sought favor from false gods instead. Let Israel's example stand as a warning to us to turn from temptation, to leave sin behind, and to trust in the Lord's promises and His faithfulness to forgive, that we may bear fruit for Him and follow Him on the way out of this world to life eternal. 1 Corinthians 10, beginning at the first verse. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. <laughs> Nevertheless, with most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. 
Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Those are the words of our epistle lesson for this morning. Please rise. Join me in the prayer of the day of the gradual, which you find printed responsively in your bulletin. Arise, O Lord, do not let evil men prevail. Let the unbelieving be judged in your sight. When my enemies are turned back, they shall fall before you, O Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Unto you I lift up my eyes, O Lord. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Hallelujah. The Gospel lesson is taken from the Gospel according to the Evangelist Luke. We read from chapter 13. We begin there at verse 1. Thinking ourselves better than other sinners leads to ruin and destruction. We should take Jesus' advice here and examine our hearts and sorrow ourselves over our own sins rather than judging the hearts of others and seeking God's forgiveness instead. Luke chapter 13, beginning verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. So far the gospel lesson. Praise be to thee, Christ. We continue our worship by together confessing our Christian faith. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed as you find them in the Lutheran hymnal, page 12. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. The Word of God upon which we meditate as we take up our Sunday series during Lent, What Then Shall I Do With Jesus, who is called the Christ, is taken from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26, verses 47 through 50. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately, he went up to Jesus and said, greetings rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. These other words. In the name of Jesus the Christ, who despite our betrayals, still died for us, dear fellow redeemed in his most precious blood. This morning as we continue to follow Jesus, we find ourselves in the Garden of Gethsemane. It is very early in the morning, but we are all well rested because like the rest of Jesus' disciples, we have slept rather than stay awake 
and watch and pray. Jesus has been watching and praying for all of us. And he awakens us a third time to announce that his betrayer is at hand. The betrayer is one of our own, not an enemy. Still, as the mob draws near to us in Jesus, we are again forced to answer the question, what then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? Shall I stand with Jesus, or will I betray him and stand with the far greater number that comes out against him? Now, that may seem like an easy answer or easy question to answer as we sit here in a warm church on padded pews. But it really isn't an easy question at all. It's easy for us to imagine that we would have stayed awake and defended Jesus. But if we're honest with ourselves, past experience proves the opposite would be true. It's not an easy question because we have a sinful nature within us and an inborn desire to self-preservation. It's not an easy question because we always say two heads are better than one, so surely there were far more heads coming out to arrest Jesus than those who stood with him. They must have been in the right. There are more who come out to arrest Jesus and there are those who stand with him. There always appears to be more enemies of the cross than there are friends of it. What then shall I do with Jesus? Shall I betray him? May God the Holy Spirit bless our study as we confront our sin and confessing it, seek God's forgiveness in Christ, who died for our betrayals, and rose again to make us God's friends forever. Amen. Verse 47. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. We tend to focus on Judas Iscariot as the betrayer. So much so that we forget that he was, in fact, one of the twelve. Jesus chose Judas to be one of his students. Judas followed Jesus along with the other rest of the disciples, eleven, for three years. Judas Iscariot would have been paired with another disciple and sent out to preach the good news, to heal the sick, to cast out demons. Judas Iscariot had been a believer, a follower of Jesus. And then at some point, that changed. Now, we may be tempted to try to determine exactly when that took place, but that's unnecessary. Rather, we ought to consider for ourselves that Judas was once a follower of Jesus, and then he wasn't. We may boldly sing with the hymn writer, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. I wonder if Judas had that same thought in his mind at one point. We may boldly declare with Peter, even if everyone else denies you, Lord, I'll never deny you. Judas said the same thing. We may boast about our strong faith. But there is in us the same fallen nature that was in Judas Iscariot. It's true that no one can tear us from Jesus' hand or from that of the Father. But we can still ourselves choose to leave him. We can choose to make money more important than the Savior himself, as Judas ultimately did. We can choose to avoid speaking with family members who sin because we don't want to rock the boat. And in so doing, we make them more important than Jesus, or at least love them more. So before we point the finger at Judas Iscariot, let's remember that he was one of the twelve. And let's take a look at our own minds and hearts. 
It's not difficult to see how the chief priests and the elders of the people viewed Jesus either. He was to them a dangerous man. They obtained a cohort of Roman soldiers. They sent their temple guards. The group sent to take Jesus into custody is described here as a great multitude. We're not talking about a handful of people. They were armed with swords and clubs. They came out against Jesus as if he were a dangerous robber. And they couldn't afford to let get away. There are times when we may think that following Jesus is dangerous. We may tremble at the possible consequences of standing with Jesus today. In a time and in a society where those who speak of sin are accused of hate speech. As crazy as it sounds to us today, it's considered the loving approach to tell sinners that all is well and they can live as they like. A sentiment that will be proven terribly false when the Lord Jesus returns on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Moreover, on that day, those who have soft-pedaled sin and will see the error of their ways, but it will be too late. There are surely consequences to following Jesus. We are to count the cost of following Jesus before we put our hand to the plow. There are also consequences to denying him. And I don't mean choosing not to like some comment on Facebook about a nebulous God. The Spirit of God assures us through the Apostle Paul that all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So it may appear to be dangerous to follow Jesus. There are for sure certain temporary earthly consequences but there are also eternal benefits to answering the question, what shall I do with Jesus who's called Christ, by saying, I will follow him. For Jesus promises us, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So let us also count the cost of following Jesus while also, even more, counting the benefits, eternal benefits, to following him. Verses 48 and 49. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. The Gospel writer here tells us that Judas Iscariot arranged a secret sign. He told the soldiers with, have, with him, whomever I kissed, he's the one. Seize him. And then Judas proceeded to do what was considered a common, friendly greeting. It was something that no one would consider to be a malicious thing. Who would think of us as a betrayer if we walked up to a friend and said, Hello, good morning, how are you doing? It was supposed to look like a friendly greeting, but it wasn't. It was a lie. Have you ever wondered why Judas would arrange for a sign like this? Why would Judas want to use a common, friendly gesture to betray Jesus? Well, because he wanted to appear to be a friend and a disciple when he was acting like neither. He wanted to act like he was Jesus' friend when he was coming as his enemy. He wanted to deceive Jesus and the others by acting like everything was good. Good morning. How are you? Now once again, before we think to ourselves that we would never be betray Jesus in such a terrible way, we have to see that we already have. Our betrayals may not be evident to other human beings, but they are certainly evident to our God who sees the heart. He's aware of those times when we act like Jesus doesn't know what we're doing in the dark. 
Do we pretend to be a disciple of Jesus while also at the same time making private plans to sin later? Do we come to church and sing out with gusto and then spend the rest of the week trying to avoid looking the part of the goody tutu goo shit Christian? A wink at sin there, a smile at there, a four-letter word there. It becomes, becomes a game of deception. Forgive me, Lord, for all the times I have betrayed you. Strengthen me that I may rejoice to be called your child and unashamed stand up for you. But if I'm going to do that, I need your strength because I have none. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? So often we marvel at the love of Jesus, and we should. Jesus knew what was going on. The Gospel of Luke tells us that Jesus made it clear to Judas that he was even aware of his secret sign. Because according to the evangelist Luke, the same Jesus turned to Judas and said, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Jesus reached out to Judas even then. He called Judas when he was acting as his enemy, friend. He pricked Judas's conscience by asking if he was really betraying his master with a kiss, with a gesture of a friend. Jesus loved Judas to the end. He loves us to the end, too. Our Savior still reaches out to us when we sin. He may use conscience to ask us from within, what are you doing? He may use chastisement. He may use difficult circumstances to open our eyes to the fact that we are standing on the precipice and about to fall. He may use His Word to turn us back to Himself. Are you really pretending that you don't know me? Why? Do you think that I don't know what you're going through? I do. Do you think I don't care? The amazing thing is that Jesus still counts us as friends, not because he approves of sins, but because he came to win us for his kingdom and to save us for time and for eternity. Amazingly, he sees us as people who are worth saving, not because of some innate value in us, but because of the love, because of the value his love places on us. When we sin, he reaches out and says, Come back to me. Follow me. I'm going to the cross for you. How would you or I react if a friend betrayed us? Let's be honest now. It wouldn't be like Jesus, would it? We would be angry. We would refuse to talk to them, perhaps. We might even refuse to forgive them. Dangerous business. And that's because we are wretched sinners. How did Jesus react? Not like we would. Not like we do. He turned and looked at Peter, who had just denied him to call him to repentance. He reached out to Judas with questions designed to recall him. My Christian friends, let's not shrug it off when Jesus turns to us and says, come back to me. I love you. He proved it by going with those who arrested him all the way to the cross. He did it so that you and I could have a room in the Father's house with our name on it. What shall I do with Jesus who's called Christ? Shall I betray him? I have. And I may yet again. But Jesus won't betray me. But keep reaching out for me to take my hand that I do not fall into the abyss. Lord, take my hand and lead me upon life's way. 
Direct, protect, and feed me from day to day. Without your grace and favor, I go astray. So take my hand, O Savior, and lead the way. Amen. And the peace of God, which far surpasses our human understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Lord Jesus, innocent Lamb of God, you volunteered to be cursed, punished, and even forsaken by God in our place. We ask that you look with mercy upon us and hear our prayers as we meditate upon your bitter suffering and death. Bring to your people's mind in a vivid way the agony of body that you suffered for our sakes and the spiritual anguish that you felt while bearing the burden of our guilt. 
Draw us back in time to witness the blood flowing from your holy wounds and open our hearts to the realization that it flows for us. Move us by your love and tender mercy to bring our sins to you for pardon. As we consider the sacrifice you made in our behalf, help us to put to death our own flesh with all its wickedness. Through the example of your perfect obedience to the commandments and to the will of the Heavenly Father, turn us from the path of sin and help us to walk a new life as his obedient children. Dear Savior, draw us to you just as on the cross you won the dying thief so that we'd be led to accept with joyful hearts your blessing of forgiveness and treasure up the sure hope of everlasting life. As you prayed for those who reviled and crucified you, even so intercede for us with your Father. Remove from our hearts any bitter feelings we may have toward others. Let us cling to your cross in faith and may it be our comfort in our last hour so that death holds no terror for us. And grant that our souls always find in you full cleansing and perfect healing, lasting peace. To the glory of your name we ask these things. Amen. One additional prayer is requested this morning, that on behalf of a Gregorich granddaughter, uh, Leah Holsworth celebrates her ninth birthday. We pray on her behalf. Lord God, Heavenly Father, our times are in your hands. We ask that you look with favor upon Leah Holsworth as she begins another year of grace. Grant that she may grow in wisdom through your word. On the anniversary of her birth, lead her to thank you for all of her blessings, physical and spiritual. Grant her health and many blessings going forward. And grant that she may glorify you in all that she says and does. Lead her that she may be your child and an heir of everlasting life. Amen. Finally, I invite you to join me in the mission prayer which you find inserted in your bulletin. Uh, in the past, we would just note in the bulletin the things happening overseas, and I think there's a certain disconnect that takes place. So we meditate specifically upon each of the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world, and we pray in a responsive way. In Nepal, the building project of the HCLCN is almost complete. Raju and his family have recently moved from Kathmandu to the Chitwan district, where the new HCLCN seminary and headquarters building is located. The building will be dedicated and seminary classes will begin in late March when Missionary Ullman is scheduled to visit. With the lifting of COVID restrictions, the HCLCN is planning to start more preaching stations and continue construction repairs on church buildings in the coming months. We thank you, Lord, for your continued blessings on the building project. We ask that you would continue to bless the teaching of the word in this building that many more faithful preachers and teachers will be trained to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray also for those who will be reached with the gospel during the upcoming evangelism trips, that many will hear, repent, believe in Jesus, and rejoice with us in God's grace and mercy. Our brother, Pastor Montash, reports that the individuals who were assaulted because of their faith in Jesus have been released from the hospital and are slowly recovering from their injuries. Pastor Montash has been busy in recent weeks with evangelism efforts. A pastoral training seminar for 14 pastors and elders of the BLCM and several evangelism seminars are being planned while missionary Ullman will be in Bangladesh. We give thanks to you, Lord for the healing granted to your servants who have suffered for your name. We ask that you would continue to bless both the preaching and hearing of the gospel of Jesus Christ through the evangelism efforts scheduled in Bangladesh. Life continues to be difficult for our brothers and sisters in Myanmar as the military junta continues to rule with brutality. Many protesters have been imprisoned, killed, or are missing. The military continues to make it difficult for Christians to gather for worship and prayer. Most government offices and services remain closed, along with banks and financial institutions. Food and daily necessities are scarce, and prices have increased. 
We thank you, Lord, that you have provided an opportunity to send funds to Myanmar again so that we may help our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for justice and peace for all the people of Myanmar, and especially for our brothers and sisters in Christ, that the Lord will grant them strength, courage, and boldness during these difficult times. The classroom and small dormitory construction is almost finished on church and land north of Lomi. Classes with a new cohort of students are scheduled to begin on March 21st. The long-term plan for this property is to serve as the church headquarters and Bible Institute. Missionary Evenson has been busy translating and printing lessons for the new semester. We pray, Lord, that you bless these new buildings, the truth of your word that will be taught there, and the students who will study to prepare to spread your gospel in Togo. Classes with a new cohort of 10 students have recently begun at the Wittenberg Lutheran Theological Seminary of the CLC Tanzania. These students will spend the first year studying basic theology, Bible history, and English as they prepare for seminary classes next January. We ask, Lord, that you, these new students, and those called to teach and train them. Ted Quaid, who was called by the CLC Board of Missions to serve as the Christian School Instructor Supervisor, and Missionary Ullman recently returned from visiting the two schools in Kenya that are supported through offerings into kinship. Plans to strengthen the spiritual training of the teachers and students were discussed and have already begun. A water well project at the school in Moyes Bridge and a solar energy system to run the pump and provide lights for some classrooms have been completed. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your many blessings, and we ask that you continue to bless the teachers, students, and the staffs of St. David's Kinship School and Emmaus Milimani School as they grow in your word. One of the district leaders of the BELC has been suffering with some serious medical issues. He has undergone several tests and is being treated with medicines. Lord, we ask that you bless the medical treatments and grant your servants strength and healing. We also pray for your continued protection against persecution in India and for increased boldness and confidence to spread the gospel amid these dangers. The CLC Mission Helper trips in 2020 and 21 were canceled due to the pandemic. Plans are currently underway for a trip to East Africa, Tanzania, Zambia, and Kenya in July of 2022. Our brothers and sisters in Christ in East Africa are eager for the Mission Helper teams to come again to assist them in the work of proclaiming God's saving word. O oh, Savior, we ask that you clear any obstacles that may stand in the way of this trip and that plans will go smoothly. Pastor Daniel Mugeni has studied with CLC missionaries and attended pastoral conferences in Kenya for many years. Missionary Mike Garath and Board of Doctrine member Pastor Andrew Schaller continue to conduct the formal process of reviewing Pastor Mugeni's doctrinal positions for a possible recommendation for a declaration of fellowship. We pray that the Savior would bless this process and grant the establishment of God-pleasing fellowship based on agreement in your word. We think of all our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who are struggling to stay healthy, provide for their families, and the ministry as they proclaim the gospel. We continue to pray for all our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we trust that the word will not return to our Father empty, but will accomplish that for which he sent it. Missionary Evenson continues to translate into French for use in Togo and other French-speaking nations in Africa and elsewhere. He has also been busy getting coursework, textbooks, and lessons ready for the new cohort of students that will begin seminary classes on March 21st. We ask that the Lord bless the translation work and course preparation so that many more can benefit from learning the truths of God's saving word in their language 
that many more will be well prepared to serve in the gospel ministry. Missionary Ullman is working with our brothers and sisters in Christ of the Bangladesh Lutheran Church Mission. After two weeks in Bangladesh, he will fly to Kathmandu, where he will work with the pastors and leaders of the Himalayan Church of the Lutheran Confession of Nepal to spread the gospel and train pastors and teachers. Lord, bless his travel and clear any obstacles that may stand in the way of the work. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to assist in the gospel ministry in nations where less than 5% of the population know Jesus as Savior. Finally, the Lord continues to bless correspondence with an independent Lutheran pastor, Jordan. Correspondence continues with an independent Lutheran pastor in the Philippines. A first face-to-face -face visit is tentatively planned for some time in 2022. Lord, bless this correspondence and a God-pleasing unity, if it is your will. Grant Pastor Jordan the strength and understanding to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. We join to pray the prayer which our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Please rise for prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, who for the sake of your own dear Son has made us your children by adoption, we pray, govern us by your Holy Spirit, that as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to you for a sweet-smelling savor, even so may we love you and our neighbor, and walk as children of light in all purity and righteousness and truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, forever and ever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. morning. A few announcements here in the bulletin. First of all, Sunday school will follow. Bible study will not follow afterward. Your pastor was on a whirlwind baptizing tour to North Dakota and Minnesota Thursday through late last night, and he was unable to complete the work of Bible study, so sorry about that, but we'll pick that up next week. Uh, game day or snack day, whichever you prefer to call it, is also still scheduled for this afternoon uh, if we are interested in doing that. This week, Tuesday, uh, confirmation class at 4, Wednesday, choir practice and not Bible study, but our midweek Lenten service with uh, Pastor Caleb Schaller will be here. Uh, next Sunday, our worship Sunday school and Bible class uh, as usual. Thanks to all those who helped out with the tour choir this uh, past week. It's hard to believe, but it feels like that. It was, it was just last Sunday, the choir. Um, if you weren't able to be here for the, uh, for the tour choir concert, it's posted on the website. So you could actually uh, watch it, listen to it there, and uh, the audio is not too bad uh, online. So even all the mistakes or any mistakes they made, you'll be able to catch them the second time around. Uh, let's see, uh, okay. Uh, again, you know about the midweek Lenten uh, service coming this week. Also, uh, there will be an Easter breakfast. Look for information in the bulletin soon. <coughs> CLC Call News is up to date. Uh, so keep those individuals in your prayers, if you would, as they uh, uh, prayerfully consider where their gifts might best be used in the service of Christ and His kingdom. Uh, also, the, uh, there is no offering amount there in the bulletin from last week. I didn't have one, so... Um, We'll get it in there when I, when I have it. Also, on the back of the bulletin, you have Bible readings for home devotions. I encourage you to make use of those. I had intended to print off last week's and have them on the back table, but like so many things, I'm a little flighty from time to time, not remembering things. So, Lord be with you.